Welcome to Lighthouse. This is Read, Think, Act, a video series coming to you from Lighthouse Bookshop in Edinburgh. I'm Jessica Gaetan Johannesson, and it, I'm so excited and so delighted to be here today with Andreas Malm. Welcome, Andreas. Thank you very much, Jessica. It's a real pleasure and honor to be with you. So just uh, as a wee introduction, Andreas is a, a scholar of human ecology at Lund University, which is in the south of Sweden, for those of you who don't know, and uh, an author of several books, including uh, Fossil Capital and more recently, uh, this, this wonderful beast. I'm going to call it a beast because it is quite a beast. Um, White Skin, Black Fuel which was actually written as part of a collective, the Set King Collective, right? And I'd love to talk to you a wee bit more about what that means in terms of having more than one voice in a book um, and how that actually might tie into activism and collective action. There's this kind of assumption that, you know, books, books are good in and of themselves and like uh, by writing about these things, it's sort of enough or that you know, you, you books change lives, but actually when you start getting terrified, like truly terrified about things that very often you feel, well, you know, that isn't enough. Like I sort of get need to get on the streets as well. Have you ever felt like your research and writing and your activism has kind of been at odds with each other or how do you balance that? Yeah, there's certainly a tension between them. And uh, I mean, from, from an academic perspective, it's not necessarily uh, fully accepted or taken for granted, at least, that you can uh, engage in activism while being a scholar and that you can promote certain kinds of radical activism. And certainly, I mean, that tension is real. Uh, Although, I mean, it's it's also, I mean, the, the idea of activist scholarship isn't entirely foreign to, to departments, at least in social science faculties and the humanities, that you can, in fact, try to combine your scholarship with, with activism. And to me, uh, scholarship that is completely aloof from any kind of movement or cons con the concerns of, of social movements is, uh, yeah, if he, it's not something that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, of course, there is there is an almost idealist uh, overestimation of the power of, of books or texts in and of themselves sometimes. And uh, if we are materialists, we should, I think, see books as, um, how should I put this, as uh, points of communication with other people. But this for this communication to really um, become... Uh, more than just words and and become you know an exchange of of uh, of ideas uh, more in the flesh so to speak uh, then then books need to be followed up by conversations like this one or you know meetings all kinds of interactions with people uh, unfortunately of course we all know that the, the past period has been one of isolation where where uh, in real life interaction has been quite limited uh, and that's I think quite disastrous to an extent for for the climate movement in particular we had this peak of uh, climate mobilization in the global north in 2019 and then the pandemic broke out and the, the movement just fell off a cliff completely and has been largely absent from the streets throughout the pandemic and our conversations have been limited to chats on screen like this i'm not i'm not denigrating the value of it but there there's another value to actually meeting people in in real life and uh, and talking face to face and engaging in, in collective action and i i really hope that the climate movement uh, yeah regains its momentum it will ob obviously be impossible to regain all of the, that momentum that we lost uh, after 2019 but some of it really should be regained very quickly because the situation is so dire yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> we kind of we need our bodies, like, and, no. and that's actually what became dangerous in one way it was our bodies that became dangerous. What's the kind of importance of it being written by a collective of people rather than one person? I mean, other than it's massive. <laughs> so it's <kind> of... <laughs> No, no, it's it's absolutely central that it's written by a collective, and my name is just there because our publisher Verso insisted on it being singled out. Uh, 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 since I have written books before, and my name is somewhat familiar to this kind of niche audience that we're addressing, uh, 
uh, but it's it's an entirely collective project in the sense that we are 20 people who have done research together on what the far right has said and done about energy and climate in uh, certain countries in Europe and the US and Brazil in recent times. And uh, we've sort of pulled this research together and it, the, the whole idea of the book would have been impossible, I think, for any single individual to uh, achieve, or that would have to be a massive polyglot because we're, we're drawing on so many languages and, and sources. And in the collective, we have people who are not scholars who are working or who are primarily activists in the climate movement and in anti-racist and anti-fascist movements. And this, this book project is, of course, an attempt to contribute to a convergence between anti-racist, anti-fascist movements and climate justice movements, uh, primarily in the global north, but to, and we're, we are dealing with one country in the global south, uh, Brazil, which is uh, an, an obvious case for this confluence. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there are two questions that sort of rise up for me from that. And, and one of them is in the very title of White Skin Black Fuel. Um, or actually, it might not be, it's not in the title, but it's in the description of the book. Uh, there's about the ecology of the far right. And I mean, even those two words, I think for a lot of people will seem like you're pulling two, two worlds together that haven't actually been talked about very much at all. I mean, I spoke to um, Joe Mulhall late, um, quite recently from Hope Not Hate, and he was saying that, you know, the, the two movements are still kind of speaking different languages almost. How do you define the ecology of the far right for someone who just doesn't know what that is at all? Um, what is it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's paradoxical that the two movements, the climate movement and racist movement, speak different languages because much of the far right really effectively has fused concerns uh, around uh, material resources uh, and race in a very effective manner in the recent uh, half decade or so. I mean, this book was, of course, written under the shadow of Donald Trump who is thankfully no longer uh, in the White House, but he was incredibly uh, efficient in combining assaults on, uh, on climate uh, and you know, aggressive uh, promotion of fossil fuels with the defense of white uh, of power, white dominance or supremacy or power structures, whatever you like to call them. I mean, he, he did this from his first week in office when he uh, declared that now I'm going to build a wall and I'm going to ban Muslims from entering. And I'm also going to give a green light to the Keystone XL pipeline and the Dakota uh, access pipeline uh, and withdraw from the Paris Agreement. And these uh, measures were of a piece. They were completely at one with each other and unified in the agenda of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes for most of the far rights. It's the same with Bolsonaro. It's the same with the AFD in Germany, with the Sweden Democrats in my country, with the Polish far right in government, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this this is not ecology. It's not environmentalism in the in the accepted sense of the term. It's rather something like anti ecology or anti climate politics uh, that has become more and more salient in far right politics, precisely because the climate crisis has deepened. Uh, and there have been so uh, many calls for abandoning business as usual. And then the far right has sort of emerged as the most aggressive defender of the privileges that are called into question in the climate crisis and combining that defense with uh, um, at least a desire for violence against non-white others or people defined as the enemies of the white nation. Well, the other question that that brings up for me is um, I'm thinking about, you know, like people who are really engaged in the climate movement and will still say, may still say things like we have to just deal with the emissions, like deal, you know, leave anti-racism to those guys over there kind of thing. Is, mm -hmm. is that in a way a more difficult issue to tackle? I don't know if it's more difficult. I mean, if Defeating the far right it is an incredibly uh, big task in itself, and it seems mm -hmm. to me very difficult. 
uh, uh, perhaps the most difficult of all. But clearly, it's a challenge to reform the climate movement in the global north and bring it out of what is uh, largely a white ghetto. I mean, it's it's still unfortunately the case that climate movements in most European countries that I know of, at least, are predominantly white or or disproportionately white, and that movement, the, the, this movement, has so far failed to. Uh, involve people of color to an extent that's proportional only to the demography in their nations. I mean, if you look at the climate movement in Sweden, it's, for instance, the country where I live, it's, uh, it's, it's whiteness is uh, extremely overwhelming and it's, uh, and it's, it's completely disproportional to the demographic makeup of our cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, this, I think this has to do with, with the class composition of the climate movement and it's uh, the way it talks to people, it's aesthetics, it's kind of political, the kind of political language it speaks and it's so far it's inability to get out of this ghetto, metaphorically speaking. Mm. And, uh, uh, um, and, and speak to- Whilst saying that it's appealing to a broad, a broad base. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. <laughs> And the, the idea that, you know, we can tackle emissions only as, as if these were somehow detached from, from deep power structures is fundamentally erroneous. I mean, you, you can't deal with, with, with this enemy with fossil capital or whatever you like to call it without seeing how, how it is entangled with, with power structures that relate to class and race and gender and uh, uh, many other uh, dimensions. Uh, so the idea of having a kind of apolitical or transpolitical or beyond the political climate movement that it, that unifies everyone is paradoxically a, a recipe for making this movement very limited in its appeal to broad masses whom you can mobilize only if you uh, sort of activate the uh, conflicts between different groups in society that fundamentally do permeate the climate problem. Going on to a more, so say, practical aspects of yeah. your recent writing, uh, while reading um, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, one of the things that I found was really inter interesting to think about was, so thinking about one of your key arguments that the kind of non-violent direct action that, for example, XR has as its very basis uh, is, is not enough. If the climate movement or movements and the anti-fascist um, movements were to work much closer together and were to sort of cross-fertilize, I suppose, do you think that might bring with it a more diverse set of tactics yeah, yeah, to the climate movement? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the obvious analogy here for me would be Black Lives Matter, which was precisely that diverse movement. It was the largest movement in US history, if you count by the number of uh, people participating in marches, demonstrations and things like that. And it was extremely diverse uh, in terms of uh, both both white people and black people, people of color and 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 white people in in that movement. And it had a diversity of tactics, ranging from confrontation with police forces and conquering and burning down police stations, uh, over toppling statues and uh, and yeah, smashing symbols of of uh, slavery and white supremacy, and of course the vast majority of the activities which were entirely peaceful mm -hmm. and and i'm not arguing that the climate movement should uh, ditch nonviolent tactics and uh, that everyone should go out and smash things up but i do think that the climate movement needs uh, to develop and do it quite quickly a more confrontational edge just uh, as the blm movement the the uprising after the murder of george floyd had that edge and it was an integral part to that to that wave of uh, discontent that we saw in the U.S. and elsewhere. And uh, yes, I think um, that if you would have that sort of cross fertilization that you mentioned, uh, you would see a greater diversity of tactics as well. Mm. Indeed. Just well, yeah, and, and we could sort of need everything. Well, going mm. on from that, one thing that you spend a wee bit of time talking about and how to blow up a pipeline is the idea of climate camps and 
I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that and what it is about this form of activism that somehow still sticks with you as an actively hopeful form of climate activism. Yeah, I mean, the, the concept of the climate camp has a lot of uh, appeals and beauties and virtues. Um, well, one is that you, uh, you congregate lots of people um, in the vicinity of a fossil fuel installation and you have some kind of action to actually shut that installation down, if only temporarily. Uh, and uh, by doing so, you, you demonstrate that these uh, installations can actually be shut down and should be so. And their, their, their routine operations are not uncontroversial. They're, they shouldn't be perceived as, uh, as, as what goes for normal. Uh, rather, they should be perceived as, as something apparent, something that we should, we should terminate. Uh, and it's a very concrete form of action, precisely by by going into a coal mine or uh, an oil. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it could be a fossil gas terminal or whatever installation it is. You lay your hands on the immediate source of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no uh, roundabout indirectness or anything. It's directly targeting the uh, sources of fossil fuel production and combustion. And, and that's precisely the kind of action that we need more of. And uh, after, I mean, after a summer like this, there was really a season in global hell with, with everything from droughts in, in Madagascar and Iran to the wildfires in Turkey and California and uh, the yeah, floods in, uh, in Germany and uh, uh, New York now. Uh, I mean, really, in a rational world, people should be out closing down all the sources of fossil fuel production and combustion they could lay their hands on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the climate camp is what I would see as the most promising attempt in this direction. Uh, it's just that we need so much more. Yeah, and, and, and there is always that, I mean, which I think is one of the things that I really enjoyed reading your books that we just need to be fighting on so many different fronts at the same time because in order to do these things you also need like lots of people and you also need to sort of be communicating what you're doing to a huge amount of people mm. so would would you say that in in some way we do need like all movements need to some in some way be climate movements like it's not about having one climate movement but actually it needs to sort of diversify and be be huge yeah 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 i, I it's and this is an argument that Naomi klein has made i think uh, quite compellingly that the, the climate movement isn't a single issue movement and the idea isn't that, that every other movement should uh, desist from their activities and transform themselves into an exclusive climate movement. Rather, it's that all these movements and struggles need to be articulated through uh, the struggle against the climate crisis. There is a very particular urgency to the climate question because of its temporality, because of how rapidly it's speeding up and because of the potentially irre irreversible damages that we're facing. Um, that that should put it on top of the agenda for for all movements, but that's something completely different from saying that now it's all about climate, so therefore we, we can forget about class and race and all these these diversions. It's precisely the other way around. If if we're going to win this battle, we need all movements on board, and uh, because the enemy is so deeply entrenched in those structures, these structures will have to be challenged head on, which not, doesn't necessarily make the task easier, but it's it's the way yeah, reality is. But uh, anything else would be sort of dealing with the yeah. surface and not actually getting yeah, to yeah, the, exactly. the root of it. Um, exactly. That's an excellent point at which to end it on, because we are trying to keep these short. Yeah. But thank you so much for joining us, Andreas. It's been it's been such a pleasure. I feel like we could do you know three or four episodes each on on each book. But mm -hmm. hopefully, we've covered some some good ground Absolutely. here, and hope that people go out and read your work and put their own thoughts to it, and you know morph it and take it out to new groups of people and see where it goes. 
And since since uh, your viewers will presumably be located in Scotland, quite a few of them, I guess there will be uh, concrete opportunities for climate activism around COP26 coming up. I will actually yes. go to Scotland myself for that location and see what's if there's anything to engage. In. <laughs> we will we will see you there, and we yeah. will put links underneath this video and on the website for different organisations that people can get involved with um, mm -hmm. leading up to that. So absolutely, thanks so much. Thank you.